with the first pick in the way too early 2024 rookie mock draft. Again, it's super flex, so it's naturally Caleb Williams. I don't think there's really another player in consideration outside of maybe the 102 that you can go to here. Caleb Williams, I get he did not have like a great a great season this year, right? At least he did not live up to the hype of greatest quarterback prospect of all time. But the raw talent is there. The flashes are there. The playmaking, the arm, everything you want to see, he has it in spades. There are a few knocks, and, and I think they're fair. right? When you look at what he struggled with this year, he struggled against some elite defenses. He struggled in some primetime key moments. Maybe it's coaching. Maybe it's playmaking players around him. Maybe it's Caleb Williams. I don't know. But I do know scouting quarterback is hard and passing up on elite tools like Caleb Williams has, I think is a huge mistake. He's going to be the one one in the NFL draft and he should be the one one in super flex drafts. Are you feeling the same way right now? Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like there's a lot of uh buzz right now because Jaden Daniels won the Heisman and you got Drake may as well too, who definitely has a lot of tools and we're see- I actually just saw a CBS mock draft that had Daniels going one one and then Drake may going one Oh two. And I'm like, why are we already doing this? Like we already know Caleb Williams needs to be the 1.01 because he has shown us time and time again over the past two years at USC that he is just that dude, the creativity, the, uh, the mobility, just everything that Caleb Williams has to offer traits wise is so tremendous. And I look like you can look at the stats over the past two years, like just the raw numbers. And you might say, well, he had a drop in production from year two to year three. But a lot of that can be explained because he also threw the ball. Well, he's played two fewer games, but he's thrown the ball so far to this point 112 fewer times than he did last year. His yards per attempt is actually higher than what it was last year, and his touchdown percentage has dropped from 8.6% to 7.7% from last year to this year. And he's phenomenal. Everything this year, like rate-wise, has been as good, if not better, than than last year. It's just he just hasn't been throwing it as much. And he is still absolutely phenomenal and deserves to be the 1.01 in basically every single Superflex rookie draft. The only other consideration, I think, that for the 1.01 this year that a lot of people are going to have to make, especially in Superflex League specifically, is Marvin Harrison Jr. He is the wide receiver prospect. Like, like everything that you want in a wide receiver, if you could create a guy in a lab, Marvin Harrison Jr. He is phenomenal. He has everything you want. He has size. He has actually really fast speed, like long speed as well, too. He has the route technician. He's like, he got massive wingspan, like everything you want for a wide receiver. Like, I don't even need to spout numbers because you already know the numbers are crazy. It is Marvin Harrison Jr. But Justin, I know that I've already been asked this already a few times. I know we're going to get a bunch of questions about this throughout the entire draft season and process. Would you... Be willing to take Marvin Harrison Jr. over Caleb Williams in super flex leagues. Yes. So there is one scenario. There is one. You have two top 10 quarterbacks in Dynasty. I'll give you my, I'll just give my own example, right? I have a league where we went productive struggle. We landed the 101. We have Justin Herbert. We have Dak Prescott. I will be taking Marvin Harrison at the 101 because what what, what am I going to do with Caleb Williams in that scenario? Like Marvin Harrison Jr. is, I I will say, probably the greatest wide receiver prospect I think I've ever seen. Like he clears Jamar Chase, and Jamar Chase was a freak of nature coming out of college as well. Marvin Harrison Jr. is the 101 and is probably the best wide receiver in the last 10 years. Like I don't know if that's an exaggeration, if it's hyperbole, but I firmly believe that with with the football I've watched over the last decade, it is very difficult to find a guy like Marvin Harrison Jr. that feels this surefire coming out of college and you just know he's going to be a top 10 wide receiver for the next like decade so getting to like i think what is going to be the first tier break for a lot of people the 103 here again i think you can probably go two different ways with it i'm gonna go with drake may at the quarterback position now drake may did not have again another quarterback that did not meet expectations this season right drake may had a spectacular 2022 he regressed in 2023. I don't think anybody's going to argue that. But again, it comes down to what are the physical traits that Drake May has that make him such an intriguing prospect? I think a lock 
at the 102 in the actual NFL draft with the Patriots. I'm assuming that's where that goes. He is a freak athlete, you know, very, very athletic for his size, has a live arm. I mean, just an absolute rocket, can throw on the move, can command a pocket, can just control an offense. He is this year's Justin Herbert. Like, that's who he reminds me of coming out of college. Big, fast, strong, and a little bit inconsistent. That is exactly what Justin Herbert was coming out. And that's exactly what Drake May is right now. Can't, could he be a bust at the next level? Absolutely. Any quarterback at all, including Caleb Williams, can bust at the next level. But when you're just trying to pinpoint the things I want in a quarterback, he has them in spades. The intangibles... Well, you know, that's yet to be seen. We're going to see if he develops and learns and and grows in the NFL. But if he gets the right coaching staff, which all of these guys are going to need, Drake may very well could be a top 10 dynasty quarterback in the next two years. I love the fact that you went right to Justin Herbert because he was also the first name that came to mind for me too. a guy that, you know, is definitely very productive in like a non SEC kind of conference um, and is is kind of one of those guys that. People seem to really, really like him and other people are kind of, you know, iffy on him. They're not necessarily sure on what he's got. But like you said, cannon of an arm, super mobile and athletic as well, too. Like And and Justin Herbert had all of those things as well. I think what is going to separate him, like I don't want to say he is Justin Herbert. And so now we're just putting that career arc and that kind of rookie season breakout on Drake May. The difference, I think, is that if especially if he goes to the Patriots, You know, Justin Herbert came in, he had Keenan Allen, he had Mike Williams, he had Austin Eckler, like he had a supporting cast around him that was conducive to a good fantasy environment. Drake May, if he goes to the Patriots, probably is not going to have that. He could, he could get like, here's here's what I will say for this. Right now it's terrible. Like it's bad. It's Demario Douglas, Ramondre Stevenson, who like, you're not excited about them being your, your top two options probably. But in the second round, there's guys like Troy Franklin. There's guys like Xavier Worthy, potentially. At the top half of the second, I would I will be floored if they do not grab a wide receiver there. And they also don't come out of like free agency with like Pittman if he makes it or Higgins or one of the other top wide receivers. Like one way or the other, I don't see them rolling with this terrible of a group into 2024. Yep. Yeah, I I would hope that that would be the case. In which (laughs) case, I would have (laughs) way more confidence in Drake May if he went into New England. Yeah. Um, But uh, you know, and and maybe maybe May is just that good that maybe he's like C.J. Stroud, who kind of turned a a Nico Collins and a Tank Dell. He elevated them with his own talent. Mm -hmm. I don't think Drake May is as good as C.J. Stroud was coming out of college last year, but I could see that as a realm of possibilities. But moving on to the 1.04, I'm going back to the wide receiver position. And honestly, I think that we have an argument here that Malik Neighbors is closer in a, as a prospect to Marvin Harrison Jr. than anybody else in this entire class. It honestly feels like the running back situation, like the running back class last year, where Bijan was in a class of his own, and then Jameer Gibbs was in his own tier right after that. And there's nobody else even close to the RB2 last year. And that's how I feel with the wide receiver one and wide receiver two in this year's class. Malik neighbors in any other draft class would be the wide receiver one if it wasn't for Marvin Harrison, basically, uh, except for Jamar Chase's here. I was, I was, I was like, easy, easy, easy. He's in 90, the conversation. <laughs> 95% of draft classes, he would be the wide receiver one. Uh, he is that good. I mean, you look at like 85 for over 1,514, and that's only in 12 games. Like not even to mention the fact that he could have, he could continue to do even more if he was playing in bowl games or anything like that. Uh, he is just absolutely phenomenal. He is everything that you also want in a wide receiver. I think he honestly fits more of a prototypical wide receiver kind of skill set in today's NFL um, than a, a lot of other people, and maybe even to a certain extent Marvin Harrison Jr. as well too. Uh, just because Neighbors is just a freak in every facet of the game. Malik Neighbors is going going to just be an unbelievable consolation prize for somebody that's looking for a wide receiver, doesn't get Marvin Harrison, and ends up with Neighbors. Because he is, yeah, like he is a prototypical wide receiver one in today's NFL. Fluid route runner, wins at every single level, good speed, elite hands. I'll be very surprised if he gets past 
like six in the NFL draft. Like he's he's gonna go real early. It's gonna be like Chase Waddle Smith. That's how this class feels. And it it's just an absolutely, absolutely insane class. Like this has turned out to be, I think, just one of the better starts we're gonna see in the first five, six picks than, than we've had, I think, in a couple of seasons. And one of the reasons Malik Neighbors is so good is my 105. And it's Jaden Daniels. And I think Jaden Daniels is very, very different than Caleb Williams and Drake May because he is this year's Anthony Richardson. And by that, I mean the ceiling is Lamar Jackson. It is overall QB1 in fantasy. The floor is crippling. It is non-existent. The reason he's exciting is the rushing upside. 700 plus rushing yards each of the last three years going over 1,100 in 2023. That type of dual threat ability is what makes him interesting. That's why we're going to, you're going to see people just fall in love with him from a fantasy perspective. And he may never be that quarterback. Like he may never be a Lamar Jackson MVP caliber guy, but he's going to have several top 10 fantasy seasons, at least on his rookie contract. Like there's again, a ton of upside. I hate just saying that over and over and over, but if you're taking him, you are taking a home run swing. The reason why I didn't go with him at 104 is because I'm still not 100% certain on his draft capital. I think a lot of people are saying, you know, I just said at the very top that CBS had him going 1.01 because he won the Heisman. I've seen that. I've seen him still being obviously top 10 because there's a lot of teams in the top 10 that are very quarterback needy and could go for a player with a ton of upside like Jaden Daniels, like the Colts did last year with Anthony Richardson. Uh, but I could also see him, you know, sliding a little bit. Lamar Jackson was a late first round pick. Jalen Hurts, as you mentioned, was more of an early second round pick. See that the last two years at LSU were phenomenal: fifty-seven total touchdowns, uh, fifty-seven passing touchdowns, seven interceptions. Obviously, twenty twenty-three was amazing. I'm a little bit worried about one-year wonders, but I don't think Daniels is a one-year wonder. Like this isn't a Kenny Pickett situation. I don't think um, this could be maybe closer to a Joe Burrow situation where Burrow showed spurts and instances in other seasons especially the year prior to his massive breakout at lsu daniels is kind of the same situation here but i'm still i i just i don't have enough information on him right now to solidify him over an all-world wide receiver talent like malik neighbors let's move away from the quarterback position uh justin because we need to talk about i i'm ready to say it the best tight end prospect i think i've might have ever seen in the past i mean you said in the past decade for marvin harrison jr I think Brock Bowers is the best tight end prospect I've seen, at least in the past decade, uh, because he is phenomenal. He is better than Kyle Pitts. He is just as athletic. He is way more productive at Georgia immediately from year one. I mean, he had almost 900 receiving yards and 13 touchdowns as a freshman in the SEC and just continued to have that same kind of production every single year year i've already kind of penciled in brock bowers into the commander's offense uh, as the like new travis kelsey for eric b enemy's offense i'm assuming that he takes over the head coaching role plugs in brock bowers into the travis kelsey role and bada bing bada boom we have the next you know great tight end and and already a fantastic tight end landscape right now with all the rookies that we had um this past season but brock bowers is phenomenal i think the only question about him is where does he where do you, does he fall in rookie drafts the, is, am i taking him too high am i taking him too low and then how do you feel about him within the tight end position in dynasty as a whole this season is going to obviously i think just in general raise the stock of brock bowers because there are now more teams than ever it feels like that have a solidified option at, and two i think his situation is going to dictate where he goes heavily he's gonna meet the bill it's just a matter of the situation is going to dictate where he ends up landing inside of the top eight picks because i don't see him sliding past that so finally getting to pick a non-quarterback at 107 i'm gonna take rome odunze out of washington and i'll be honest i'm not he's not my most exciting wide receiver in this class i think he's sort of here right now out of just necessity i, I don't know if he will stick here for me long term right he has the size he has all of the production with michael Penix the last two years he is a smooth route runner but he lacks some things that i love i don't know if he's the world's greatest route runner i don't know if 
he is the most athletic or the most explosive or the most consistent. So I think there are some flags that people aren't that are just kind of like breezing past because he did just have a spectacular 2023. He gives me weird Quentin Johnston vibes, which probably isn't fair. I think he's a significantly better route runner, but talk me off the ledge. Get me excited about him because I'm taking him out of necessity, not because I want to right now. But to me, he is a fun prospect. I, I mean, he's definitely not neighbors or Marvin Harrison Jr. And you're correct. You're very accurate in terms of this is now a ledge that we've kind of stepped off of. Uh, what I was kind of alluding to with the Malik neighbors being in a tier of his own. But Adunze is fun, man. I mean, he if you like George Pickens, you would like Romo Dunze. I mean, every single one of his highlight catches is just this like weird off balance body control catch. And then he somehow gets his feet in. It's uh, it, it's all over his highlight reel where uh, and, and maybe you can point to the argument that, you know, he's not a great separator. The route running is inconsistent or not super technical, a little bit more raw in that scenario. But I mean, he makes up for it definitely in terms of just the catch radius, like you said, and just being able to win 50, 50 balls, 50, 50 balls for him are a hundred balls. That's essentially what he has going on. So I really like Romo Dunze. He is my wide receiver three right now, but I have another player uh, in uh, Troy Franklin, who is the, my next pick here at the 1.08. Um, he is my wide receiver four, but they are neck and neck dude. Like if you look at their advanced metrics, they are so eerily similar. Like their yards per team pass attempt this past season, Franklin was at 2.94. Odunze was at 2.95. Their market share of receiving yards this year. Franklin was at 31.1. Odunze was at 31.9. They are freakishly similar in terms of the actual like, like raw numbers and advanced numbers. But I really, really, really like Troy Franklin. I think he is going to be an excellent wide receiver at the next level. He has the elite breakaway speed, but also can act more as a possession wide receiver as well, too. Which, I mean, when you look at like his size and everything like that, like he's very tall, very skinny. You already get like Devonta Smith vibes from him because of that. But I think the ability to stretch the field, but then also work as a possession receiver also lends itself to Devonta Smith kind of play style vibes that you see him that you saw him do at Alabama. And you're now seeing him do again in Philadelphia, where he just kind of operates all over the field and is just a consistently elite option in the NFL. And that's why I really, really like Troy Franklin. Honestly, if I were to rank my hype for these wide receivers, my hype for Franklin is higher than Odunze, but I think Odunze just has a little bit more something. And I think the NFL likes Odunze a little bit more too. You can see that pretty pretty much how they're graded out across right. mock drafts, big boards, everything. Odunze is clear far and ahead where Franklin is a top 50 player. Odunze is a top 12, 15, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 15, 12, wherever you want to put it. Like, I, and I do think it's just because Franklin and th these are just comps I've seen across the league because his size is it's atypical it, being his height and his weight is just not something you see often in the NFL. It's like DJ Chark, Josh Reynolds, maybe a little bit of like Robbie Anderson or sorry, Robbie chosen, chosen Anderson. I don't know what the hell it is, but like it's those are like the kind of guys that end up being closer, like physical comps. He's faster than Josh Reynolds. He's not Josh Reynolds. That's that's mean. Um, I think he's better than Robbie Anderson. I think that's mean as well. DJ Chark early in his career, that type of production wouldn't shock me. But the thing is, his footwork is significantly better than DJ Chark. Like he is a lot quicker laterally than DJ Chark ever was. He was a straight line sprinter, always has been, was always kind of a, a crappy route runner. Uh, Troy Frank Franklin is not that. I don't have the same like lofty ceiling that you're starting to kind of to formulate here. I think he ends up being like a really good wide receiver too in the NFL and maybe a little bit lower volume because he's used on a lot of vertical routes potentially. But I think in the second round of the NFL draft, he is going to be like a perfect, a perfect fit similar to how like T Higgins was when he came out. T Higgins has never been I think like a true number one, maybe it's because Jamar Chase is there. Maybe it's because other physical tools, but I think Troy, Troy Franklin going that route and kind of teetering around that tier would make a lot of sense as like a ceiling comp for me. I think that is exactly where I would place his kind of, like you said, his ceiling, like a T Higgins, a, a Jordan Addison with Justin Jefferson, you know, you a, a Devonta Smith with AJ Brown, like that kind of, these guys are very elite wide receiver twos that are inconsistent on a weekly basis because they're not the wide receiver ones. Jalen Waddle maybe is another good example of that kind of thing too. Um, or, or maybe 
maybe he ends up being the wide receiver one on a team, but he gets like a, a Michael Pittman kind of situation, you know, where that is, you know, that's ceiling for him as the only guy on his team. All right. So sticking with the wide receivers at the 109, I think people probably expected him to come off the board sooner. Uh, it's going to be Keon Coleman. And Keon Coleman to me is, again, probably the one of the higher upside wide receivers in this class, but also as a crippling floor. Like you notice a theme with a lot of the guys I'm taking. It's just I, I'm drawn to these players that have, I don't want to call it league winning upside, but like elite level upside. Keon Coleman has all of the size that you want in a true, like traditional kind of throwback almost wide receiver one in the NFL. I think it's what, 6'3", 210 pounds. And I might even be selling him short on an inch. I think he's 6'4". 6'4". 6'4", 210 pounds. And has the ability to go up and catch basically any single ball that is thrown in the stadium. Like there is no place he cannot reach. And that is the good. Like that, that is what you want to see with him. The downside for Keon Coleman and the, probably the reason he's sitting here is He's a raw player. Like he has run a full route tree, but to say he's run a full route tree very well, I think would almost be lying to you. I think his footwork needs to get cleaned up. And if his footwork can take a step forward, no pun intended there, he can really develop kind of how DK Metcalf has, right? DK Metcalf came out, gets taken in the second round due to questions about lateral agility, his ability to run a full route tree. Keon Coleman, I think, is a step ahead of DK Metcalf as a route runner currently, but the footwork is still lacking. So you have this elite playmaking ability. You have this elite size that you can't teach. Maybe not true DK Metcalf level athleticism, but damn near close to it. And you're looking at a player that, if he puts it together, can be an absolute force on the outside, right? Not your traditional wide receiver like a Marvin Harrison or a Malik Neighbors but a DK Metcalf, T Higgins type of guy that is just going to bully you on the outside and either be a really damn good wide receiver two or a really, really solid wide receiver one. I have I have issues with Keon Coleman. And listen, I I, I was all aboard the Keon Coleman train uh, before the season started. And then he immediately comes out, uh, opens up the season with nine for 122 and three. And I'm just like, oh, dude, Keon Coleman is here. He's here for sure. But he... The, the season was so up and down. Like, how do you do nine for 122 and three? And then two weeks later, don't have a catch against Boston College. And then two weeks after that, go three for 22 against Virginia Tech. But then the following week, nine for 140 and one against Syracuse, but then gets one for one for 24 against Florida. It's just, it was so up and down for Keon Coleman. His his metrics are not good. Like, you, you look at his yards per team pass attempt. It is not good. His... Uh, market shares of stuff are just not very good either. He just never really did enough at Florida State or at Michigan State to really, I think, warrant being a first round NFL pick or, or, or somebody that we're, you know, excited about like we are, you know, not even just about neighbors or but like kind of how we are about Odunze and kind of how we are about Franklin and maybe some other wide receiver prospects in this class. Like, I do think that one feather in his cap is that he outproduced Jaden Reed at Michigan State last year. So right. I think that, th that that counts for something. That is notable. That is very something. good. But I just I, I just don't know how to feel about Keon Coleman because he just does not check enough boxes for me analytically that when you talked about Romo Dunze being the Quentin Johnson of this class, like I feel like Keon Coleman with how raw he is as a player and kind of missing on some of these metrics in college that he feels like the Quentin Johnson of this class that could be the player we look uh, forward to in a year and say, you know, he, he ended up not being the greatest first round rookie pick. All right, but with the 110, let's get away from the wide receiver position. We'll still get away with from the quarterback position. Let's talk about the first running back prospect in this class. And side note for this, I'm working under the assumption that Travion Henderson is returning to school at Ohio State. We haven't heard anything in terms of an actual decision being made since like that rumor that he's going to get all this NIL money to stay. So I'm assuming that he's staying. And if that's the case, then my RB1 in this class is Braylon Allen out of Wisconsin. And I absolutely love Braylon Allen. He has been a phenomenal player three years in a row at Wisconsin, starting out immediately as a freshman. Uh, he broke out and just had insane production 
after not even playing the first couple of games uh, as a freshman either. And then he just continued that as a sophomore, continued that as a junior. And this past year, in that air raid system at Wisconsin, a new offensive system, he showed receiving ability, not like insane receiving ability, but he showed, you know, work in the screen game, work in, in kind of like the flats and stuff, uh, which is definitely still very acceptable for the type of player that Braylon Allen is. And I do honestly expect him to be a second round pick. And I have already kind of penciled him in to be a Baltimore Raven. So uh, I'm <laughs> so I'm kind of working on the assumption that Braylon Allen is a second round pick to Baltimore. And if that's the case, 110 might be a little bit too low for him in a super flex rookie mock draft. But I don't know. How do you feel about this running back class? How do you feel about Braylon Allen? Is he your RB1? And am I a little bit too high on him? Braylon Allen, it was always him and Travion Henderson. Like those were the two. I mean, he's what, 6'2", 240. The dude is an absolute tank. And naturally with that size comes concerns about like lateral agility. There's not a lot because when you're that big, it's very difficult to, to move side to side quickly. And I think that's fine. He is going to be a North South hammer. He can run similar to a Jonathan Taylor. He doesn't have the pass catching questions coming out because of the shift in offense. We actually got to see a Wisconsin running back catch passes. And he's only 19. He is still 19 years old as we record this video. That is the craziest part of this whole entire story, dude, is that he came in <laughs> to college as a 17. freshman. At se he played his entire freshman season at 17 years old. <laughs> now, I'll say this. He's, he's going to turn 20 in January. But, like, until then, <laughs> he can say Braylon Allen is an NFL prospect at 19 years old. He just has the physical tools that you want. And given the lack of running back talent coming in this year, like, I, I ultimately think he'll end up getting pushed up draft boards because people are going to draft for need. And Braylon Allen is going to be one of those guys that, you if you need a running back well there's one you, you better go get him and it's going to be like it's going to be fine i think he's going to be very damn good it would help him if this wide receiver class wasn't as elite as it feels i think he'd be much higher i think he's being pushed down and it's creating weird optics because of how strong the rest of the draft is so naturally at the 111 that means we're back to wide receiver because there's no other running backs to take so we're going with another wide receiver out of ohio state it's going to be a mecca abuka he had a phenomenal 2022 and i think if kyle mccord wasn't so just just terrible he has a significantly better 2023 and a mecca puts up under a thousand yards and again I, I do think it's because of kyle mccord he's over 1100 with cj stroud the year before the knock if you want to knock a mecca for anything right he has the the six one size he is he's very similar to malik neighbors in that he lacks the elite athleticism and he really operated out of the slot a ton so it's not to say he can't play on the outside right because he has size but he really kind of filled the jackson smith and jigba role like that's what we ended up seeing so what does that mean at the next level for his overall ceiling, right? Does he just end up being a big slot? Does he end up being Keenan Allen, Cooper Cup? Or do they force him outside and maybe we realize he can't win out there? So, like, I think there's more inherent risk with Emeka Abuka because we don't really know where he's going to end up fitting in at the next level. If you draft him and he plays outside and he ends up winning outside, he looks like a steal here. Because I think the route running is next level. The footwork is nutty. Like, all of the things that are just going to have him open all the time are really damn good. It's just, are those targets coming underneath with a low a dot, or are they going to be on the outside, allowing him to kind of work the middle of the field, you know, 10, 15 yards down. That's I think ultimately what it's going to come down to. So I think draft capital scheme are really going to end up driving a lot of his value. I do have concerns that Ibuka could fall out of the second round and be like that third round pick that we saw, you know, Josh Downs be that we saw tank Delp be and, you know, like that's not the end all be all. It's not worst case scenario, but it is something to take note of that. Maybe that's something that drives his rookie draft value down lower to where than where it is right now. I do feel like his his upside is like Jarvis Landry, like that slot kind of wide receiver, like you were saying, not overly athletic uh, or anything like that, but it's still solidly technically sound. He's decent and he can operate as that you know, more slot wide receiver two in an NFL offense. And if, you know, especially in PPR leagues, if he's getting 80 to 90 receptions for a thousand yards, three or four or five touchdowns, like that is going to be more than enough to be a top 30, top 25 
fantasy wide receiver. And that is kind of, but, but it just sucks because that feels like the ceiling. So the final pick of the first round for this Superflex rookie mock draft, but I'm gonna go with my favorite upside kind of pick in Xavier Worthy out of Texas. Now, Xavier Worthy has a lot of good things going for him analytically. Like obviously he came in and just immediately produced as a freshman. As an 18 year old, he has the breakout age. He has almost a thousand yards and 12 touchdowns at Texas in 2021. The unfortunate part with Xavier Worthy is that he never really grew upon that production. You know, like as a sophomore, 760 yards, nine touchdowns this past year, 970 yards, five touchdowns. Like there was just no growth. And that is scary, but I do think that an NFL team is going to look at Xavier Worthy and the traits that he has and still take a shot on him in that second round, like Jonathan Mingo, like what we're kind of projecting for Keon Coleman as well, too. He operates very much as a Troy Franklin kind of player at Texas. Uh, and, and that's why I kind of like getting the discount on him here, uh, just compared to Troy Franklin and then also compared to Keon Coleman is he feels like just as much as a project wide receiver, um, kind of as Keon Coleman, like I said, and, and maybe a similar wide receiver stylistically to Troy Franklin. It, it just, he feels kind of like how we were talking about Rasheed Rice last year, where there's a lot of tools, there's a lot of good stuff. There's not, there's some bad stuff, but it's just ultimately going to come up to being how quickly can he develop and what NFL situation does he land in? But I am more than happy taking Xavier Worthy here at the end of the first round uh, as the wide receiver seven, I think, in this class, six or seven. If he ends up 5'11", 160, that's what player profiler has him at. If it's real, couldn't tell you. If he ends up there, you're going to get so many tank Delcoms, and that I honestly, th I think that might work in his favor. Like, <laughs> like being undersized in this kind of like weird gray area, considering Tank Dell is coming off of something spectacular this year, he's going to get moved up, and people are going to chase a potential outlier in size. Like, if he's 160... It's going to be very difficult for me to get really excited about him, especially at 5'11". Like that BMI is going to be like 0.5. He's going to be dust in the wind. Like it's going to be, it's going to be crazy. So this is where again, guys, it's December. We don't have combine metrics. We don't even have full seasons for some of these players. Like there's, there's a lot of things that will change, especially as the NFL cycle starts to turn. You get a lot more nuggets of just you know, intangibles and data and all these extra points start to get teased out. So do not take these as, as Bible yet. We have several months for this to get dialed in. There will be massive changes. I can almost guarantee that.